Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Honorable Chief Guest, Respected Chair of the Session, Respected Director General of BIIASS, Distinguished Paper Presenter, Learned Panelist, Excellencies, Ladies and Gentlemen, Assalamu Alaikum and a very good afternoon to all. On behalf of Bangladesh Institute of International and Strategic Studies, BIIASS, may I take this opportunity to welcome you all to today's seminar on application of carbon financing, challenges and policy options for Bangladesh. Today, we are very much honored to have among us Vaseka Aisha Khan MP, Honorable State Minister, Ministry of Finance, Government of the People's Republic of Bangladesh as the chief guest. Learned audience, today's seminar will be chaired by M Ambassador AFM Gausul Azam Sharkar, Chairman BIISS. At the outset of the program, Major General Muhammad Abu Bakr Siddiq Khan, Director General of BIISS, will deliver his welcome address. This will be followed by the keynote presentation by Dr. Mahfuz Kobi, Research Director of BIISS. Thereafter, there will be a panel discussion. For the discussion, we have got five learned panelists who are going to deliver their insightful perspectives on today's subject of the seminar. Followed by that, the floor will be open for open discussion. Afterward, the Honorable Chief Guest will deliver her invaluable speech. Finally, today's chair of the session will make the concluding remarks. Ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, may I now request the chair of the session to kindly commence the program. Thank you. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Your Excellency, um, as Waseka Shakhan MP, Honorable State Minister, Ministry of Finance, Government of Bangladesh, and our Chief Guest today, Major General Muhammad Abu Bakr Siddiq Khan, Director General BIISS, Learned Panelists, Excellencies, Distinguished Guests, including media friends, colleagues, ladies, and gentlemen. Assalamu alaikum and a very good morning to you all. It is a great pleasure for us to have you all at this seminar on application of carbon financing, challenges and policy options for Bangladesh. Bangladesh, you know, is one of the most climate vulnerable and affected countries and very much in need of climate financing and compensation under various carbon financing schemes and international arrangements. But due to twin problems of the lack of carbon financing avenues and complicated procedure of applying for this financing amidst a knowledge deficit of many of our actors engaged in carbon reduction efforts. Bangladesh is not able to avail as much as it deserves. So actually, uh, that gives the context for this uh, seminar today. And we'll be listening to learned uh, panelists. And uh, they are very much experts on the subject. and. Uh, also, we have uh, our Honorable Chief Guest, who is uh, a prominent uh, uh, figure uh, in, in the subject, very knowledgeable, and uh, who is also involved in uh, uh, climate parliament. So now, uh, with the, uh, one more uh, point I'd like to highlight here is that um, this is, uh, in fact, the beginning of the BIISS discourse on the subject of carbon financing. And uh, we also have a plan for organizing a workshop, because that is uh, the format in which uh, we can involve the stakeholders and particularly businesses who do uh, the carbon reduction 
efforts and who actually take up the carbon reduction projects and uh, businesses. So they are the beneficiaries. So with them and also with the international experts uh, of different international organizations and definitely under UNFCCC, uh, we will hold that uh, sometime in the next half of this year. So now I'd uh, like to, uh, without further ado, request uh, uh, Director General PIISS to make his welcome address. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Respected Chief Guest, Osega Aisha Khan MP, Honorable State Minister of Finance, Government of the People's Republic of Bangladesh, Respected Chairman of Bangladesh Institute of International and Strategic Studies, Ambassador AFM Gausul Azam Shakkar, Planet Audience, Distinguished Guests, Media Representatives, Ladies and Gentlemen, Assalamu Alaikum and a very good afternoon. On behalf of Bangladesh Institute of International and Strategic Studies, I welcome you all to today's seminar on application of carbon financing challenges and policy options for Bangladesh. Our heartfelt gratitude to respected chief guest for gracing this occasion with her kind presence despite her busy schedule. At the very outset, I would like to pay my solemn reverence to the memory of the father of the nation, Bangabundu Sheikh Mujibur Rahman, the main architect of our independence. I would also like to pay my tribute to all the martyrs and the freedom fighters who made their supreme sacrifices for the liberation of Bangladesh. Ladies and gentlemen, in recent years, the global community has increasingly recognized the urgent need to address climate change and its impacts on our planet. Bangladesh, with its vulnerability to climate-related disasters, stands at the forefront of this challenge. As we navigate through the challenges of mitigating climate change, the application of carbon financing emerges as a significant tool for the process. Carbon financing involves the monetization of carbon credits earned through reduction of greenhouse gas emission. However, the road to realizing its full potential is full with challenges for a developing nation like Bangladesh. Dear audience, one of the foremost challenges lies in the implementation of the viable carbon offset projects. Balancing economic growth with environmental preservation requires creative approaches and strategic investments. Additionally, the lack of institutional frameworks and capacity poses significant hurdles in carbon financing management. Strengthening regulations, technical expertise, and fostering partnership are essential steps towards overcoming these challenges. It is equally essential to explore policy options best fitted to the context of Bangladesh. Adapting a comprehensive approach that integrates climate change considerations into national development strategy is paramount. This requires collaboration between government agencies, private sector entities, civil society organizations, and international stakeholders. Learned participants. Promoting public awareness and participation is pivotal in generating grassroots supports for carbon financing initiatives. Empowering local communities with actively engaged in climate resilience efforts is necessary for fostering sustainable development. In conclusion, the journey towards achieving the full potential of carbon financing in Bangladesh is undeniably challenging. This comes with opportunities for innovation and collaboration. By addressing the challenges and embracing in inclusive policy measures, we can pave the way for a more sustainable and resilient future for generations to come. Distinguished guests, I'm confident that the, that the deliberations and insight shared in today's forum will have meaningful action towards realizing our shared vision for greener, more prosperous Bangladesh. 
Finally, I again express my gratitude to respected chief guests, distinguished panelists, media representatives, and the learners audience for encouraging us with your kind presence. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Joy Bangla. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Major General Khan. Now, uh, I'd like to uh, request uh, the keynote presenter today on pathways of uh, carbon financing imperatives for Bangladesh. Dr. Mahfuz Kabir is uh, Director BIISS. Thank you. Respected Chief Guest, respected Chairman and Director General of BISS, fellow panelists, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. Assalamu alaikum and a very good afternoon to all of you. So uh, now I, I'm going to present on the pathways of carbon financing imperatives for Bangladesh. So I'll start my presentation with the whole greenhouse gas emission scenario of the world. So if we see the trend, uh, starting from the year 1970 uh, to uh, the year 2022. It's a data of the uh, European Commission. It's the latest data, of uh, emission database of, for global atmospheric research. So the whole uh, greenhouse gas emission was more than doubled by this year, time. So, and the majority portion comes from the direct carbon dioxide emission. So it is uh, about uh, 39 giga ton of uh, carbon. So. And if we see the sectors, then you, you can see that on the uh, right hand side of the uh, graph. So the power industry that emits the highest, 28%. But if we consider the carbon only, so it's about 38%. Then transport, then internal combustion is uh, the, uh, 12%, the agriculture uh, 12 and, and fuel combustion uh, 12%. But uh, the others are the. And then uh, about the impact, the emission by countries. So uh, the uh, among the total emissions, so the China emits the highest, so it's about uh, 16 by gigaton, and which is followed by the USA, it's, uh, six uh, gigaton, and followed by India. So these are the three, in fact, major uh, countries, and afterwards European Union and Russia. So if we uh, consider the combined, in fact, emission by the top ten countries in the region, so they together emit for more than two thirds of the emission. But if we see the one to one correspondence between the total emission and the per capita emission, so it's there is a surprising in fact reality. So, uh, even though China is the highest emitter in terms of total emission, but they uh, emit only uh, 11 in fact, ton of uh, per capita uh, carbon, so the carbon dioxide equivalent, so greenhouse gas. And uh, which is, uh, if we see US's in fact, emission, so it's about 18 ton per year. And for India, so even though it's third, but still less than three ton. So uh, because of this, I mean, the, uh, there is an so, And then it's a global target, which is called net zero and by 2015. So uh, now if we see the, in fact, baseline, like I mean, the year 2020, so, and 2022, in, uh, in the year 2020, as already mentioned, the global carbon emission was uh, about 39, in fact, gigaton. 
So, and since we have the net zero, uh, in fact, target by 2050, so we have to significantly reduce uh, the carbon emission, but we have the net positive right now. So, and, and if we see the business as usual scenario, and even though there are a lot of impact, uh, adaptation measures and, and the renewable energy projects across the world, so, but still, I mean, the, the rate is not that significant. And by the year 2050, so there will be 22.2 uh, gigaton of uh, carbon that should be closed by 2050. So, and afterwards, uh, from the year 2050 to uh, 2100, that means yeah. that uh, at the end of this century, so we have to have 300 gigaton of uh, carbon that could be closed by the net negative emissions. So, we have a target, it's a global commitment under the UNFCCC, so, and that need to be achieved. And why we, we need to achieve this? So in order to keep the temperature rise below 1.5 degrees Celsius uh, as per the Paris Agreement. So for this, we need a lot of financing. So what are the estimates? So if you see the uh, AR6 of, of the Intergovernmental uh, Panel of Climate Change of the, of the year 2022, so, the annual requirement is 4.5 trillion US dollar until 2030. And there are other studies like McKinsey, so they have also done that, uh, uh, the estimates. So between 2021 to 2050, so the requirement, the total requirement would be 275 trillion. That means per year it would be 9.2 trillion. And there is another study, Song Stan and Bhattacharya. So you heard about Stan, in fact. Uh, so in that study, for the in fact, emerging market and developing economy, except China. So the requirement is 1 trillion per year uh, by the year 2025. 20, and afterwards, by 2023, uh, 2030, so it's 2.4 trillion US dollars. And if we consider the latest estimate by the World Meteorological Organization 2024, 20, uh, so the average requirement would be 4, uh, would be 8.9, in fact, uh, a trillion US dollar in uh, 2030 and afterwards in 2050s it would be more than 10 trillion US dollars. So you see the funding requirement and what are the sources? There might be some sources like the Green Climate Fund, but I uh, we think in fact there's a global community of, of experts and the policymakers they think that carbon financing would be one of the most viable sources. So uh, and it would be an innovative financing tool to, towards achieving the net zero by 2050. So. It, it, the carbon financing places financial value on, on the carbon emission and it allows the companies to buy carbon credit to offset their own emission. So the companies are distributed in, in Bangladesh and other developing countries which are fast growing like the Indian companies and also the big multinationals. So they also emit carbon and they in fact buy the carbon credits. So it, it also brings sustainable energy solution for developing countries as well. So and, and the trading carbon credits are introduced by in, in uh, the year 1997 under the Kyoto Protocol, and it's the first international decision to cut the carbon emission globally. And there's a clean development mechanism, as you already understand. So, and it allows the industrial countries with the greenhouse gas emission reduction uh, commitment. So, the, the global commitment and, and their global allowances for, for the companies, especially the big multinationals and, and the uh, countries as well. So. In fact, approved CDM projects, they uh, produce certified emission reduction. So it's it's called CER, which is in fact known as carbon credit. So, and which can be traded with the businesses, industries, and countries as well. So there are two main types of carbon financing. One is the carbon tax. So we, we have already started implementing Bangladesh uh, from the current fiscal year. And the emissions trading system, ETS. ETS is known globally, so and, and it's pioneered by the European Union and there are some other countries that, that follow the ETS. So, uh, for example, a part of, in fact, USA, not the whole USA, and a part of Canada, and, and also Australia, Japan, New Zealand, so they, they have, and even South Korea, so they have the ETS, and China has also started the ETS from the year 2021. So, and what about the pricing? So, we, uh, we need to assign the prices of, of the carbon, emitted carbon. So, uh, there is a suggestion by the International uh, Monetary Fund, so which is a, a $75 per ton of carbon, in fact, carbon dioxide. So it is the optimal, in fact, uh, carbon uh, in fact, price, like a uh, carbon tax. So what about the carbon, in fact, uh, credit? So that is an important thing, because if you see the markets, so, which I'll be sharing uh, after some slides, so it varies uh, 
that is significantly across the markets. Like if you go to the European Union market, so the price is high. But if you go to a Chinese market or South Korean market or even Australian, New Zealand market, so the price is low. And there's a spot, in fact, value. And like, I mean, the stock market, if you go to the stock market, then and the price is uh, fluctuate. Okay, now briefly about the carbon trading system. So there is a process of, of carbon trade itself. So if you see the emission reduction activities, it starts, the process starts with this. And then, so there are projects like I mean, the renewable energy projects, which is the most important source of in fact, emission reduction and improving energy efficiency through the production processes and process of, of transport and other economic activities and uh, protecting forests like I mean, the afforestation and deforestation. So these are the most, the principal in fact, activities from which the uh, reduction in fact, projects uh, come. Then the verification. So it, it happens and uh, as you already understand, so the, some of the projects from it, pioneered by it calls, so they are registered with the UN FCCC, and uh, the CDM projects go through this. And then uh, verification, in fact, happens. So there are, in fact, verifiers like the, uh, if we see the name of some of the important verifiers in the voluntary market, so the uh, verified carbon standard, so VF, uh, CS, and then gold standard, and then uh, climate action reserve and American carbon registry. So they, in fact, explain most part of the, in fact, the registries. And then issuance, the individual government, so they, in fact, they issue the uh, carbon credits, and afterwards the registration takes place. So it's the history of, of the sale of, of carbon, and then they're uh, they used as, as a ownership. The, so all these are, in fact, accounted for. And afterwards, carbon sale takes place. So in, in the companies, and organizations and the countries, they, they in fact uh, buy the, uh, the carbon credit. And afterwards, when it is used, uh, uh, so then uh, there's retirement of the carbon credit. So this, in a nutshell, the whole uh, process of carbon credit itself. And who are the buyers? So all the big, in fact, multinationals, and, and in fact, uh, so they, they buy the uh, carbon credit, like Microsoft, Shell, in fact, British Petroleum, Nestle, Google, everyone, and Amazon, Delta Airlines, United Airlines, Coca-Cola, KP Morgan, Goldman Sachs, in the, and what not. And what are the important countries, like the North American countries, uh, Canada, USA, then China, South Korea, New Zealand, Australia, so they buy. And also the UK and the European countries, so they also buy. And surprisingly, there is another market, so it's Kazakhstan. So they also buy the, in fact, sorry, no. So, and, and what, who are the potential buyers? Definitely, buyers of the, like, I mean, the RMG factories, they, they can, uh, in fact, buy uh, the uh, carbon credit, like Bangladesh, in fact, RMG exporters. So, they can be one of the important buyers. So, and if you see the prices, so, interestingly, so, it, this is the trend, and, and this uh, chart has been taken from the World Bank's report, the latest report of the state and trends of carbon pricing 2023. So, ETS, that means the uh, the emission trading system of the European Union. So they uh, offered the highest price, so which is followed by the New Zealand. But definitely, as I already mentioned, so prices fluctuate in, in the market and de it depends on the demand and supply. So the whole forces. And definitely the ETS, actually it's the, uh, the in fact, involuntary or compliance market. So, and, and in that market, there are a lot of regulations and there are a lot of transaction costs as well. And because of that, and because of the demand and supply, so, yeah, and the prices are determined. And actually, I have tried to, in fact, capture the, in fact, the spot price. So it's the data of, of the 10th of May of uh, 2024. So it's a live carbon price. So if you can see the, in the, fact, the price is fluctuating. And it's the voluntary market's price. So who are the, in fact, voluntary buyers? So the aviation industry offset. So they're, uh, then uh, important, in fact, buyer, then natural based offset and take based. So if you see the price, so it's only, I mean, the 50% per ton. So for the aviation industry and natural based offset, just $1.05. And, and for take based, so it's only, I mean, the 61 cents. So for the compliance market, price is quite high. So for example, the European Union, so they offered a 73.62, uh, in fact, euro per ton, and then UK is, uh, Good price, 38 in fact, pound, and then California, and then Australia, New Zealand, South Korea, they are important uh, markets. But surprisingly, for South Korea, it's only, it was only, I mean, the six dollar uh, and 43 cents. And China, in fact, they, they also provided good, good price. 
Okay, now the map of the carbon taxes and in fact emission trading system. So it's it's a global distribution of, of maps. So if you see the in fact wine color, so it's uh, it indicates the ETS and carbon taxes both are implemented or scheduled. So you, you can see the countries. I mean the the European Union countries and parts of Canada, and then Mexico, and then uh, parts of in fact uh, South uh, America. So uh, you see the French. Uh, Guyana, so they are, in fact, surprisingly, they are in fact, offering a good price and, and they have the, in fact, both ETS and carbon tax and also Uruguay, so they, they have this both. And then you see the in fact, blue, in fact, sky blue, then China, Australia, so, and parts of Canada and parts of USA, including Washington. So they have that, in fact, the uh, ETS, either implemented or scheduled. And then if you see the other parts like the, in fact, so, uh, in parts of the, in fact, uh, European Union and also Chile, uh, Argentina, so they also have that, in fact, uh, the uh, carbon tax implemented or scheduled, and then ETS, so it's a lavender color. So, uh, ETS or carbon tax under uh, consideration. So, but still, if you see the other parts of the world, so they have not, in fact, undertaken or they have not decided regarding the ETS or carbon tax. And then, in fact, carbon price level, the highest price is already offered by, by the, in fact, the European Union and then France, Guyana, and we, we can see Uruguay. So they are providing the highest price. They, uh, and uh, other, other parts of the world, they, they, the prices vary. And now about the carbon tax, I already mentioned. So it has already started in, in Bangladesh. So it's uh, imposed on uh, owning additional car and it ranges based on the in fact, a capacity or I mean, a cylinder capacity of, of the car. So ranging from 25,000 to uh, 350,000. And there is an additional amount of, uh, in fact, environmental protection uh, tax, which is 75,000 for a, a, a range of CC, like, I mean, the 2001 to 2,500 CC of uh, car, Jeep, microbus, and then definitely it's a second car. And in addition to that, the government has increased the import duty. On the on the cars, so it's significantly increased. So it's all can also be considered as a carbon tax. But I was thinking that it's more of kind of traffic congestion tax. So it, the same thing. Okay, and it call is the authorized to sell the CR because it has been registered with the UN Triple C. So it started selling a carbon credit in, in two thousand and six. And so far, so it's according to the data of, of the last year uh, of, of May of 2023. So sold uh, 2.5 million of carbon credits and, and earned uh, about 16.25 million US dollars. But if you see the price to credit ratio, it's about $6 per credit. So, and uh, I guess, even though I don't know the exact scenario, but I guess that these credits are sold not in the European Union much, but maybe in, in the other uh, in fact, countries. Okay, what are the uh, in fact, carbon credits sell uh, uh, challenges? So the lack of awareness and capacity among the stakeholders. So that's very important thing. Uh, it's just very often we, we see that the, in fact, the demand side of the carbon credit, like the big businesses, they don't have the full information regarding the carbon credit, in fact, generating the domestic market and also insufficient funding. So this whole calculation requires a lot of funding because if you, in fact, want to invite the international impact calculator or the, like the agencies, entities who are involved in the voluntary markets like American Carbon Registry and others, so it requires funding. And also the, in fact, local calculation auditing the, and, and also the, in fact, baseline and inline. So the, this also requires, in fact, a lot of funding. So, and the shortage of skill manpower because uh, this requires advertisement and, and full knowledge regarding the in fact, carbon emission and an adaptation technology and then low emitting technology. So, and, and in this particular field, we don't have that much of in fact skill manpower. And Bangladeshi RMG exporters, they are constrained by the incomplete info. So, and you have in fact the sales procedure uh, and uh, it call is in, in the lead, but I think there are other organizations as well. Uh, so, they promote the solar and other in fact, renewable energy technologies, but they don't have that kind of impact linkage with the international market. 
and lack of strategic investment. Even though we, we are pioneer in many fields of environment protection and climate change, like we have the 85 plan and the second perspective plan, as well as the national adaptation plan. So, uh, and also we have the Muji climate prosperity plan, definitely data plan. So in all the plans, we have strong commitment towards the uh, climate change adaptation and mitigation and resilience, but still, at uh, this particular field, like um, the carbon financing, is not that much highlighted. I hope that in the next in fact, uh, highway plan, this particular issue will be adequately covered. And now it's the final part of my presentation. So we need to streamline the CDM in fact, uh, within the uh, country policies and financial instruments. So the Bangladesh Bank has prepared the report. So, uh, but it was back in 2015. So it has in fact identified the the areas of intervention, but and also, there are in fact financial instruments like the instruments for the green financing. So it, these are in there, and it's, it's channeled by the private banks in Bangladesh. But uh, unfortunately, so this particular issue of carbon financing is not in fact specified in the financial policies of Bangladesh. And also, uh, and definitely, we need the financial instrument and it should be proper. And then we need to reduce the transaction cost because I had already mentioned. So there are a lot of important financial requirements for calculation. And, and for other matters. So, and the issue is that there are a lot of in fact, small scale projects which are in fact implemented by ITCOL and there are other parties, so they also implement. So, and if we consider accounting for all the in fact small projects then the transaction cost will be high. So if we bundle all these projects together, then transaction cost will be lower and then provide favorable conditions for off-grid solar system. So photovoltaic and, and solar home system. So they are small projects. So if we go to Chors and Howards and, and also the coastal areas, you'll find a lot of impact with the solar home system and small projects, but these are not properly accounted, even though it called can channel and it's, it's channeling. So, but still, I mean, I think uh, that there's a lack of, of in fact, integration of all these projects. So as, as the uh, for potential carbon peak earners, and create opportunity to, to small scale projects. So we have to, in fact, uh, have some kind of financial instruments and, and incentives for them so that I mean, the small companies, so they can, they want to invest in, in this uh, renewable energy and other, in fact, low in fact, emitting projects. And uh, we need to ensure that the carbon credits being purchased, uh, they, they're genuine, genuinely, in fact, accounted, verified by the re recognized standard entities. So this is very important for the image of the country because we are one of the pioneers in the solar energy and other in fact adaptation technologies, mitigation technologies, but we are not in fact uh, being able to in fact sell our image uh, in a proper way. And if the very, in fact, recognize very high entities, uh, they, uh, they come, then it have, we can in fact promote our in fact, initiatives in the international level. And government initiatives are required. Uh, to sell the carbon credits, as already mentioned. So it, it's my doubt, but I think, I mean, the uh, idea of it calls, so we can, in fact, clarify this. So we are getting low price. So, uh, and we need to get the high price, and it, it's available in the international market, like the European Union and others. So we need, we need to negotiate with them. So that's required, and it's important. And we need to uh, generate quality carbon credits. So that's very important thing. So we are generating carbon credit, but it has to uh, have a good quality with the advertisement properly. So that is required uh, for, in fact, uh, international market. And it can be done through proper evaluation and project auditing and verification. So that's required. And for example, in, in nowadays, PKSF is implementing a lot of in big programs like ACP, which is funded by the World Bank. So, and there are many other projects. The smart project is coming. But if we do the proper auditing and verification, then it can also generate uh, some of the carbon credits that can be sold in the international market. So, and then we need to develop policies to incentivize the uh, investors. So there might be local investors, there might be in fact or di direct investment. So if we have the proper policy and financial incentive, and there might be some projects which can be in fact registered in the stock market as well. So we can benefit a lot uh, from, from this and establish a strong voluntary market. So it's the first step. If we uh, start voluntary market, for example, India has started, but it's for their domestic market, not for international market. So we can, in fact, go step by step and uh, we, we can do good. I mean, the, and afterwards we can, in fact, go for the in fact, compliant market. And we need to uh, make the biz businesses aware uh, of their carbon footprint and, and encourage them to uh, take necessary steps to purchase the carbon credit. So, and that's why we invited the business community to discuss and, 
that to raise their, their issues regarding the carbon market. So, and that's in a nutshell of the carbon financing. And I hope that we, as already mentioned uh, by the respected chairman, so uh, we we are just starting. So we have a long way to go uh, towards this carbon financing, and and we don't have much time. So because the, the, for the year 2050, so we only have uh, about 25 years. So we have to have, take a lot of preparation, and and there is an uh, instrument like I mean the European Carbon Border Management for which we have to be prepared. Our business community, especially the RMG manufacturers, so they need to be uh, prepared for that in fact nitty gritty. So. And for that, we uh, need a, a, a carbon market and uh, to get, in fact, a proper sales of and, and buy, buying of the carbon credits. So with this, I would like to end here. Thank you very much for your patient hearing. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Marcus Kabir. Uh, I'd now uh, request uh, uh, as uh, Yoon Ju Allison E, Senior Environment Specialist from the World Bank, to uh, make reflections from the policy and uh, practices. Okay, thank you very much, uh, all of you esteemed guests. It will take me a long time to say everyone's name, so I'm just going to thank everyone for the honor of position here, opportunity to share and, and support this very important topic. So uh, thank you so much. And um, our chief guest, Wasika Adam, is also, thank you. Uh, my name is Unju. I'm the Senior Environment Specialist at the World Bank. I'm going to ask if you could hide the preview box. Whoever is working on this, can you hide the preview box? I think there's a preview box of me in here. So if you could just hide it. So um, first of all, thank you so much. This is a topic that's very near and dear to me. I actually have worked in carbon finance uh, from 20 years ago. Uh, I look older, right, than that. <laughs> Younger. Oh, OK, good, good. Uh, actually, this is a topic of my uh, keen interest because it's about market mechanisms. And today, I, I'd like to give, uh, following this great talk from the uh, BISS uh, sir, I'm going to give a little bit of a shift of the car discussion around market, environmental market mechanisms. So today I'd like to talk about what's green growth for Bangladesh and environmental market mechanisms. At the end of the day, carbon finance or any of these financial mechanisms that we're doing because we're trying to pay for the cost of pollution, period. It is too hard to do otherwise. And that is why countries have created carbon environmental markets. Um, so just to give you a little bit of a, a slice of some ideas, there are many ways that you can commoditize pollution. Carbon is just one of them. And so if we look at the tools of incentives and instruments, there's everything from taxes to charges, pollution levies, and in, in addition to the carbon financing, these are all mechanisms that the government can manage to do that helps private sector, the public sector and the government manage the cost of pollution abatement costing. Okay. And I, I can share some of these slides with you later. I just to give a few of the background and then I'm going to come back to it. Um, and I'll come back to carbon finance in a minute. So there are many countries in the world that are taking measures. Vietnam, for example, is using a lot of the mechanisms as I just talked about, whether it be uh, environmental protection taxes like Bangladesh, pollution charges, environmental funds, standards and regulations. And that same goes for, sorry, I have two slides on this. I'm going to move. They've also put some emission, emission standards and regulations. I myself have worked with the Vietnam government about five years ago as they started to explore carbon financing mechanisms to improve their industry. They wanted to help the private sector to afford modern uh, energy systems. That's a high cost. So they allowed the creation of a financial market, a carbon market that allowed Vietnam private sector to access low cost loans that allowed them to make the investments needed. Again, these are market mechanisms for environmental uh, changes. So South Korea is the same. I think we got some, some highlights from the previous presentation. South Korea has also used a number of instruments 
And again, I, I want to bring the conversation a little bit wider than the word carbon finance or carbon trading, because actually Bangladesh has many other fiscal instruments that are li uh, linked to regulation and policy. So taxes are one of them that Korea has done, but they also have a greenhouse gas emissions trading system, which was already presented, carbon tax and water pollution fees and so forth. So now I'm going to switch gears a little bit to talk a little bit about why why am I very happy to be here for this opportunity to talk about what's good for Bangladesh? How can, how can we leverage this for the modernization, the middle income status that we need to achieve together? Um, first of all, when we look at the mechanisms that we're talking about, we really have to think about what is the environmental impact you're trying to achieve? The environmental impact you're trying to achieve will give you the costing. What is the cost needed? We need to know exactly the cost needed. I do appreciate that it's gonna cost billions and trillions of dollars. But that's a globalized figure. Let's talk about how much it will cost me at my home, my apartment, my office, my car. Let's discuss what is that cost of abatement it's going to cost me for the environmental impact that I create here locally. Because actually, economics-wise, prices are localized. The hamburger here is a different price in the US and a different price in Japan. It's a very different price. Second is economic efficiency. One of the main drivers of carbon emissions is fuel. We saw that in the previous presentation. We import quite a lot, over 96, 97% of fuel, fossil fuel to Bangladesh to power our economy. How can we get independent? It's good for profit. And at the end of the day, it's gonna be good for the environment. So we are, I know that there has been a lot of discussions about Bangladesh is not the emitter, absolutely true. But Bangladesh can be an economic gain if we make modernizations and improvements in these structures. So uh, the same, the next is equity. We have to think about the poor. We should not tax the poor of carbon uh, burdens or tax burdens or environmental burdens. What can we do to make sure we appropriately share the burden in an appropriate manner? To do that, we, the government, we, the, the World Bank is helping you right now, but we, we need to work on identifying the segments and what should different segments pay and share in terms of the burden? So what should private sector of a certain size pay? What should government of a private sector governments pay? We need to understand the segment of targeted uh, structures. Uh, sorry, I, I don't know what's going to happen here. So uh, the other one is revenue generation. This is very, very critical. Uh, moving forward, as a previous presentation a pre presenter pointed out, Carbon finance leverage for Bangladesh is vast. The amount of funding that's available, not just in, in bilateral agreements, but in capital markets is significant. There are billions of private sector investment planning and working for investments here in Bangladesh, but they cannot enter this market. And I'll tell you why. <laughs> Compliance and enforcement. If we really want to leverage carbon finance, many of these environmental financial instruments, we need to support our enforcement and regulatory structure in the country. That really means that we have to help DOE. That means we have to help Ministry of Industry. We need to have people and machines and technology to provide really good data to BBS so that the national government can have very solid, verified data when it comes to some of these sources of data. Data and uh, compliance is critical. So I know that we talked a little bit about the carbon credit issuance, and I'm not going to spend too much time on this, but this is a very basic structure of carbon um, credit issuance. One thing to note here, if you look at one through five, what I would suggest you do is make a suggestion, which entity in Bangladesh can do this now? Each one. Assign one, two, three, four, five, an entity in Bangladesh who does it now, who could do it, who could be supported to do it. So these are the different functions that have to be done super well and clearly so that you can have a carbon financing infrastructure and framework. And actually we have many of these entities already. The DOE is one of them, the industry, the, the, the Department of Boilers, many different entities in the country are already doing pieces of the work needed to create that enforcement and institutional environment. They have not come together, unfortunately, but I'm hoping that through the discussion today, we can have a conversation about how we can bring the right entities together to create that framework of institutional structure. Um, 
And just to finish the agenda here, MRV is critical, and I know this was brought up as a topic, right? MRV is very, very critical. We need to measure, report, and verify. Uh, I think it's just like banking. You know, if you put money in the bank, it's verified it's there. It's my money. I can take it out. It's very clear. There's no questions. When is carbon unit or it's a reduction? Let's say you put a new boiler. I need to make sure that that new boiler you put in is more efficient. How can I get that certainty? Is there a digital way for me to get that information? Is there somebody that I can send that I can trust that get that information? This kind of verification system is now at our fingertips. Bangladesh is leading in ICT and technologies and firms. We have over 3,000 firms in the country. Why do we not create more jobs in environmental finance mechanisms? The number of jobs that this mechanism, carbon, environment can create is vast for Bangladesh. It's a new industry for everyone. We need to create new jobs that support the entire infrastructure of this institution. The lack of knowledge you, you suggested is absolutely correct, but it's because we're not investing in curricula at the professors in the university. We're not investing at the companies. We're not investing at the public institutions enough in this area of jobs. This is a, a many, many countries have created the green environmental industry. So a measurement, if you look at emissions factor, and if you look on the right, this is all technology. Can Bangladesh do this? Yes. Are they doing it? Yes, they are. Are they applying it? No. It's because at the moment, many of the entities that are working around green growth or green financing or carbon are not brought together. We need a central entity. We need a central entity to take the leadership, to coordinate, to convene. Uh, the terminology we often use is uh, a control tower. So mostly every country in the world, especially for carbon financing or environmental market systems, has a control tower. Normally that control tower is usually Ministry of Finance and the Environment Ministry. Those two ministries generally serve as the control tower for most countries' uh, environmental financial mechanism. It means that they work together to enable other countries, other um, ministries, apologies. So measurement is very critical, and uh, you know I'm, I'm pointing this out to, to say that it's very possible to do. Simply put, uh, when we look at reporting, this is the next level, right? We have various institutions. Your institution is one of them, but we have various others that can be the person who can say we ex ante or post ante verify that this is this is there. Um, and these are things that many other countries have gone through and more than happy to work on how we can identify, if, a, if the country can identify the key players, the next step is just to further strengthen their, their functions. So verification is very critical. So we we look at the carbon registry and registration, and, and I've left this for this, you know, sake of to, to give a different of an institutional picture of who does what and what are the different steps. I think it's very, very useful as you laid out, um, sir, that you talk about the different mechanisms. Now we can go into who can do what. Let's assign. Let's say who. Is it DOE? Is it the Department of Forestry? Is it the Ministry of Industry? Who can do what function and who will be the control tower? So I'm gonna go fast. Um, so I'm I'm really happy to share that actually um, I've been working for the past year and a half on an analytical work for, for the World Bank. And I've put together a proposed green growth framework for Bangladesh. And this is based on uh, learning and studying the national plans for Bangladesh, the Muji plan, the eighth five-year plan, the Delta plan. Uh, as, as you said, so there are a lot of great strategies and plans, which is great but often they come with limited authority of institution and limited budget that's guaranteed. And that makes it very difficult to implement all of them. So what I've done is in order to take a look at what are we trying to move on to in terms of framing the green economic growth for the country, what are the things that could be done very quickly, very fast together uh, to remove barriers and to allow us to go forward. So I have put together nine policy actions only and I'm proposing, and actually I'll be having an event, I'm hoping some of you will come <laughs> on June 13, but we'll be uh, launching this policy framework, a proposed policy framework for green growth for Bangladesh implementation, not a strategy, but to implement the strategy country has. Number one on that policy direction of nine is what you see here, strengthen the environmental governance and accounting system. Not just carbon, not just, uh, you know, just one or two pollutants, it's all of it. 
if you look at the blue economy, we also want to account for our natural capital. We want to account for the pollution. We want to account for the air. We want to account for water pollution. If we can count it, we can measure it and we can start creating fiscal mechanisms. So these nine policy directions that I put together, what's the trick is they have to be done together at the same time. So basically it's an orchestra. So it's really hard to listen to Mozart with one violin, right? Right? It's not possible. Generally, in a concert, you have many instruments playing at the same time in a synchronized fa fa fashion with a conductor. What we need now for Bangladesh, what we're proposing, is that we focus our limited resources, our expertise, our limited people, and focus on just nine policies. If these nine can be conducted and implemented at the same time, many of the interaction issues could be removed in terms of barriers. Um, so what you're seeing in the first, second, and third column, I'm just going to walk you through this, is from the first column, you're seeing mostly government regulatory items, enabling energy independence, promoting inclusive connectivity through green transport, logistics. These are all mostly governance and regulatory. The second is new growth engines. These are industry. These are livable green uh, cities. These are blue economy. These are all mostly around industry and what the production and generation can do, it is doing with the help of an, uh, regulation on the left. On the far right is transition to enabling in green. This is consumption. On the right, you see social protection, public human well-being, cleaner environment, and actually more engagement globally in a strategic fashion for Bangladesh. What you're seeing on the far right is consumption. So if you look at the three columns, it's a market mechanism. This is called the market mechanism approach of implementing economic growth because you have regulation, production, and consumption, right? For those of you that are economists in the room, you'll see the simplicity. So let's come back to the carbon again, and I'm, I'll be fast. I know I'm running out of time. So if we look at carbon, and, and you've done already a great job walking through the carbon uh, leverage and opportunity, Actually, there are more, you know, under Article 6.2 with Bangladesh is party to and may even join, I think. Um, there are ways to, under the Paris Agreement, because carbon, CDM, JI, these are a little bit outdated. About 25 years ago, they came ITMOs. ITMOs are the tra international transfer of mitigation outcomes. This is a little different. This is more useful for industry. This is more industry for us in Bangladesh. Why? We don't need so much infrastructure right now to take advantage of this. These can be through bilateral G2G relationships. Okay. And, the, and, and most importantly, they're partly done with, for example, through uh, pilot projects, right? They can be anywhere from, um, they can be, you can do energy efficiency. If we can verify to technology and engagement, an ITMO bilaterally can be done. Right now, I believe Korea and Vietnam are discussing a $300 credit for Vietnam to go clean industrially. So that means Korea is going to pay $300 million for industry in Vietnam to go clean. Right? These are business deals and, 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 and finance deals. So just as an example, the carbon pricing, I just want to touch on carbon pricing before I go, because it's very critical. Yes, the price in EU is high. The price in China is low. Korea is low. This is a, a national market. So as a, as a Bangladeshi seller of credits, it's not that you can go, okay, I'm going to sell it in Europe. Because in Europe, there are limits. How many credits come from outside of Europe? The reason why it's high, because there's not many credits available to you. There's not many credits available in the country. The reason why any country does carbon mechanisms is they want to clean their country. And they want the private sector to be able to afford the cleaning of the country. So the US EPA did the clean air cap and trade to clean United States air pollution. And it worked. When it first came out, the prices per ton was $200 for knocks and socks. Over five years or so, it came down to $40, $20. So it's a market mechanism in that country. So I think this is something to be noted. Here, what I wanted to show you very quickly, 2010, when a framework act on green growth was published in Korea at the parliament. And thereafter, this allowed the first allocation of tradable greenhouse gas permits. So what I'm saying is here you're seeing a progression, 2010, 2012, 2018, 2021. 
it's a stepwise process. We will also go through similar steps for us. We will have to discover. And I'm, I just want to show you this as an example. For Korea on the left side, what they did is they made a test. They did a pilot. They started with voluntary, then they went into ETS, and then they also created a different mechanism. And this is most important for everyone here, particularly Bangladesh, is they said, look, if you admit less than 15, I know we have to go. I'm sorry, time is up. I should stop. So one, one thing for, for, the, for the sake of our small businesses in Bangladesh, so what Korea did is they split the burden. So they said, if you're a company that makes less than this, then we will treat you differently in different requirements. If you go over, we'll treat you differently in different requirements. And this is very unique. Nobody else has it in Europe and others. So Europe has studied the Korean market for this. So um, I'm not going to be able to cover all this. So I'll, I'll stop. And uh, I appreciate that we're going to be able to talk more a little bit more. Thank you. Apologies. <laughs> Uh, thank you indeed uh, uh, for your uh, detailed uh, discussion. Uh, I'd like I'd like to request uh, Mr. Arif M. Faisal to take the floor, and uh, I'd request uh, uh, all the speakers uh, to please uh, keep within the time. Uh, you have ten minutes, sir. Uh, thank you, His Excellency Wasikar Aisha Khan, Member of Parliament. Honorable State Minister, Ministry of Finance, uh, Chairperson, Moderator and Panel Members, and I have seen, I can see some of the distinguished uh, person here, Dr. Arunesha Sar, Nuru Jaman Sar, Oniru Jaman Sar, and many others. Good afternoon. I have requested by organizer to discuss on two issues. One is how can actually we improve the access to international carbon market. Second is role of the development partners to accelerate the carbon market. First of all, we can access to carbon market and carbon business, carbon trading is very juvenile phase because we are still at the learning curve. And first of all, we need to reform the policy. We have lots of policy documents. And one of the finest policy regarding this thing is actually nationally determined contribution. We have prepared the national determined contribution and we have updated uh, in 2021. So we need to understand that we need now clear regulation and incentives, particularly for promoting green types of industry and also afforestation, deforestation program, carbon capture storage, sustainable transport, particularly the electronic mobility, and attract investor to participate in carbon trading. And we need to establish domestic carbon market. Uh, the keynote speakers have already mentioned that it can have already sold about 16.25 million. Uh, that is actually generated from uh, improved cocoa stove, solar home system. But since we have currently uh, metro projects, and we have also the solar irrigation system, and also lots of industry, I think Bangladesh is one of the pioneer countries for promoting the green industry. If you see 10 out of six industry is a green I mean, the green certified building in Bangladesh. And many is converting to green industries. And we have also uh, opportunity, particularly to if we can transform the all, all the urban area, particularly the roof area, rooftop area, convert it to the solar. Particularly, there is a huge uh, potential for promotion of the utility scale solar home system. And Mass transport is another area that we can explore actually, carbon credit. And railway is one of the classical example how we can actually assess all the emission related to transport sector. Third thing is, uh, my colleague, uh, my friend already mentioned about Yunzu about the MRB. MRB is also uh, set during the Kyoto protocol, but now 
under the Paris Agreement, we are actually supporting the government for preparation of the enhanced transparency framework. Because in earlier time, uh, only MRB was discussed, particularly for carbon credit and discuss the mitigation. But enhanced transparency framework will discuss about not only the mitigation, adaptation, and climate finance also, particularly how can we track adaptation, mitigation, and the climate finance. So this is now come under one umbrella. So we are supporting the government for preparation of the very robust enhanced transparency framework because it will be a record for a global stock taking mechanism. Fourth thing is the capacity building because capacity building is required particularly for industry uh, to know how can actually they calculate the carbon, how can measure, how can negotiate with the international company, particularly, you know, uh, keynote speaker already mentioned about uh, trading a scheme, how can trade, how to negotiate, how can ensure the integrity mechanism, particularly in accounting the system. So capacity building is very important. Fifth thing is the demonstration project, because keynote speaker uh, very clearly mentioned about that implementation of pilot project that showcase the effectiveness of carbon emission reduction efforts. Successful project can attract international attention and investment. And since it call have already uh, showed the path, I think other company can come forward to follow the it calls path, particularly to bundle small projects and make the bigger impact and get the higher certified emission reduction and selling in the international market and negotiation because there is also lots of international buyers that can actually negotiate these issues. Certification and a standard compliance is very important. So we need to formulate a standard labeling thing. Like for example, uh, there is a ER color, is a five star rating, four star rating. Energy labeling is very important for these types of things. Because in Bangladesh, it, at least more than 90% of the emission is actually coming from the energy sector. So we need to formulate policy law, particularly to improve our standard leveling and certification scheme. Last of the thing is the technology adoption. So embracing innovative technology that facilitate carbon reduction, such as renewable energy system, energy efficient practice, carbon capture and storage technology. And lastly, I'd like to mention one important thing is the financing incentives, because without providing financial in incentives, particularly subsidies in the form of tax rebates, grants, concessional finance, that is very much required for uh, bringing the new uh, entrepreneur in this market. Uh, and second thing is that, uh, the organizer requested to me to discuss what could be role of development partners to accelerate the carbon market. What World Bank, other development partner, multilateral development bank, bilateral international financial institution can play a role uh, to support acceleration of the carbon market. Number one priority is actually technical assistance is very much required because we need to build capacity of the industry owners, entrepreneurs, businessmen, particularly what is the international best practice and technical know-how, how can you account the carbon uh, assessment, carbon accounting methodology, monitor emission, how can monitor emission, and how can we verify the emission reductions things. And Financial assistance is also very much required, including infrastructure, market infrastructure, I mean, regulatory framework, monitoring system, and trading platform is very much required. Like we have lots of trading platform like uh, Korea, China. We need to set up these types of trading platform in Bangladesh. And third thing is the market access. Supporting developing countries in accessing international carbon market, including assisting with project certification is very important. Registration and participation in carbon offset program, such as clean development mechanism or 
voluntary carbon market. Currently, Asian Development Bank, they have the joint predicted mechanism system. So it is not solely uh, voluntary carbon market where actually uh, these types of multilateral development bank is providing assistance to develop a project. They are providing concessional finance to uh, industrial owner, business person. Uh, so JCM is one of the mechanism I, can, I think uh, industrialists can uh, consider about this thing. We need lots of research and innovation. Investing in research and development to advance low carbon technology innovation and best practice that can drive emission reduction and enhance the effectiveness of carbon market intervention. And also MRB system is very important, which is now uh, we are talking about enhanced transparency framework in the broad umbrella. So supporting efforts to monitor and evaluate the effectiveness of carbon market incentives, including assessing emission reduction, environmental co-benefit, and socioeconomic impact. And also the engagement of the community is very important because we are discussing only about the emission. But if you want to remove the carbon and forest can play a vital role. So sink is also very important. That is why the most of the forest in the globally, if you consider is situated in the area where indigenous people is living. So a stakeholder consultation and community engagement is very important for this. Uh, I think I have almost covered this thing, but uh, there are lots of challenge and I'd like to stop here now, uh, particularly after this discussion of the challenge. Carbon accounting system is a key hurdle, actually. It's not very easy. People are discussing about billions of dollars are available in the market, but carbon accounting system verification and authentication and get certificate is not very easy. It needs a special types of a skill. Mike from the World Bank already mentioned about that that is the fluctuate. It was only previously $12 per metric ton and $80. So it's very volatile carbon market. That is why the entrepreneur who have very low capital, they, are, they do not want to take the risk to access the carbon market. And also uh, carbon market is a very complex system. And, 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 and navigate these complexities can be daunting for organization, particularly a smaller ones with very limited resource and expertise on this thing. And also financing mechanism to support emission reduction project, sustainable financing channel like green bond. We can think about the green bond to pull money from the market and also public private partnership because we have the public-private partnership authority, I think we need to enhance capacity of the public-private partnership authority to advance this agenda. And project development cost is one of the major barrier, particularly I think if the development partners like World Bank, IDB, and international financial institution come forward to support the entrepreneurs who show interest on developing the projects. This can be a barrier for organizations and particularly uh, the small entrepreneurs who can consider to bundle all the small, small project and make a programmatic carbon trading projects. So thank you from my side. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Paisal. Uh, he's a program specialist. Uh, uh, in the UNDP on uh, nature, climate, and energy. Uh, the next uh, intervention will be from uh, Mr. Alamgir Moshev, Executive Director and CEO, Infrastructure Development Company uh, Limited, ITCOM. You have the floor, please. Uh, Salaam alaikum, State Minister of Finance, Her Excellency Waseka Aisha Khan, MP, uh, distinguished panelists, and of course, very distinguished audience here. I can see a lot of 
spots in this field. Um, it call it has come up as a case study in this discussion that in Bangladesh probably uh, in terms of uh, the uh, carbon emission reduction certificate in cashment, I think it call has done the largest volume uh, under the CDM uh, program um, where we have in, we have placed an order for $16 million equivalent of CR in cashment and the voluntary market. But till date, we have received only $10 million. So what I want to highlight here, we have discussed about many challenges uh, that, you know, this entire carbon credit concept is fairly new, not only in Bangladesh, but globally. And it is an evolving concept uh, it is a complex financial tool. Uh, myself, with a background of foreign exchange trading, I can tell you this is a derivative product. And it is not a very, the market is not very liquid. You cannot just, you know, call a trader and sell carbon credit. It doesn't work that way. Uh, for example, you know, for foreign currency or any other commodities, there are certain international markets where you could just, trade. You can buy, you can sell. Uh, but in case of carbon credit, there are different exchanges. There's not a common marketplace. That is the first hurdle. Um, in Bangladesh, the first and foremost thing that we need to do is to have the framework. Uh, because CDM has phased out. We are working with DOE uh, to, to implement the Article 6 framework. Without the framework, we do not, we cannot register uh, the projects uh, that would qualify for the carbon credit. Uh, so that is number one that we need to do. The second, you know, if we come to the it call, the clean cooking project or the ICS project, we generated this, uh, the carbon emission reduction certificates. We know that one unit of uh, CR is equivalent to one ton carbon dioxide emission reduction. And this improved cooking stove generated the highest amount of CR from many other projects that we do. The challenge is that the entire project has now phased out because the clean cooking stove project was supported by the development partner, namely World Bank. Uh, the credit line has run off and we have installed around 4 million cooking stove. But again, now we don't have the fund to implement it. So if you don't have the project, you don't have the carbon credits. Uh, so as we've been mentioning by one of my panelists, that having those projects is very important. And access to finance of those projects are not easy to start with. Coming to the other projects that uh, would qualify for CER or uh, emission reduction uh, certificate is solar irrigation pump uh, that we also uh, kind of, we have a program on SIPs. Again, the funding is not easy because SIPs are dependent on blended finance where we require 50% grant and 35% debt and 15% equity. Now, many of the development partners with other priorities, may not want to support SIPs. Uh, and again, the same question, if you don't have these uh, carbon uh, or energy efficient projects, uh, you know, the way forward is difficult. We are supporting the solar rooftop project, the industrial solar rooftop. Uh, you know that uh, uh, we have an ambition to at least have 300 megawatt of solar rooftop uh, installed by next two years. Today, it's only around 100. Um, again, you know, it requires access to finance. It requires low cost funding. Uh, it is not viable unless you can generate TACA funding at say five to five and a half percent. And we all know where the TACA interest rate is today uh, with the government security at 12% plus. Uh, you know, these are projects which require that kind of very long-term concession of funding. So that is the challenge that we have to be mindful of. 
uh, we have talked about various, you know, things that we need to do to really integrate with the carbon credit market. Uh, we need to have the capacity. We need to have the people to audit it, to assess, you know, uh, uh, what kind of projects would qualify for carbon credit. Price discovery is a huge subject in carbon credit. How much does one CER or ER of, uh, you know, uh, ICS project uh, would cost or should be priced at? What we see today is most of these projects, uh, you know, we get offers from uh, organizations, from development partners. More or less, these pricings are dictated by them, by the counterpart. You know, you cannot go and say, you know, my CR should cost $5 or $10 or $15. Um, it is more like what is the offer from the other side. And again, if you want to, you know, like uh, want to have an index or a reference rate, it is not readily available. We have talked about European market. We have talked about maybe a American market. But these markets are very disintegrated. It's not like, you know, integrated or it doesn't give you one marketplace. So price negotiation skill has to be, you know, something that we need to work on. Um, that how we would negotiate and that is where I think the international or the climate diplomacy comes into play. Uh, so that is something we also need to, to look at. Going forward, you know, as we have the the commitments in achieving 40% clean energy by 2041. Uh, the core issue is access to finance. You know, we can have all the technologies in the world, uh, but this requires a lot of funding uh, and long-term funding. Um, you know, there are different estimates, Bangladesh, Bangladesh itself to meet its targets of NDC and uh, the renewable or clean energy targets. We need around $5 billion a year is some um, number that we know. And this has to be long-term funding and institutions like Hitcall can do so much. But I keep on saying that the commercial banks or the financial sector of the country has to come into this play. Otherwise, you know, it's very difficult to kind of meet this target. Carbon credit will be another source of funding, definitely. Uh, but I don't think it will generate a lot of funding. And if you're talking about a $5 billion, what carbon credit would help is to make some of these uh, energy saving projects more viable. You know, if we're talking about say solar rooftop, um, you know, someone who is installing a solar rooftop on their roof and say they are saving maybe five taka per unit of energy, if they could sell that carbon credit, they could generally generate maybe another $1. So, I mean, that is how you really make these projects viable. Uh, but the core question remains is access to finance. We talked about green bond. Uh, the challenge is when it comes to local currency, the situation gets, the challenge gets even bigger. You know, if you want to source Taka funding, for 15 years, think about it. We have many business people out here. I don't think the local, the banks in Bangladesh has the balance sheet, or we don't have hedge funds, we don't have the fund managers. There's a huge ecosystem that we need to build. It is not time to source dollar funding because we know the interest rate, we understand the exchange rate volatility. Uh, so it's quite a challenge. You know, there's a lot of discussions, a lot of collaboration that needs to be done. Uh, the good news is uh, that many of these renewable energy projects are becoming more economically viable. That's the great news, you know. I think two years back, some of these, even the solar rooftop was not viable, really. And today it is. And I think with the adjustment in tariffs, this will become even more viable. And, uh, you know, and, and that's a great news. And I see my, with my, you know, association with the banks being myself as a banker for many years, 
I do see banks really coming forward, trying to understand how to participate in this journey. And uh, that should be a great news to solve the problem. So the way I would like to conclude my, my talk is, uh, you know, we need carbon credit definitely. There's a lot of work to be done. We are in the forefront. We're working with DOE uh, to, to put up the framework. Once that is ready, uh, you know, we need many calls. We need to really identify projects which could be registered under that framework. And we need to promote, you know, Bangladesh as a carbon credit friendly country. I think there is a branding that we can do, things that Mauritius has done, things like Cambodia has done. I think we talked about Vietnam. So we should go out and really pitch that, you know, we are ready to trade in carbon. Uh, and since Bangladesh is not a major emitter of GHG, the good news is we can be a great exporter of carbon credit. We will get many interested parties who would come to Bangladesh to pitch, you know, some of these projects. And we should take most of it, take advantage of that, and and really you know push this agenda forward. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, a question of financing. We are uh, nowhere near uh, hundred billion dollar annually uh, coming from the international uh, arrangement. So we have to uh, do a lot and go a long way for that. Uh, we'll uh, now listen to uh, Mr. Shams Mahmoud, uh, Managing Director, uh, Hasha Denim Limited uh, from BGMEA. Thank you, Honorable Chairman. Uh, Salaam to everyone, uh, respected Chief Guest of today's program, and my colleagues who are present here. Um, I just want to start by saying one thing. Um, from a private sector's point of view, the way we see this, uh, this decarbonization, I want to first of all thank Biz for starting the discussion on a very important point. Because for us, especially in the RMJ sector, we are not really worried about LDC graduation at the point at this moment. Uh, bank interest rate can be 50%. There can be no uh, supply of gas to my factory. I'm not still worried. I'm worried about this decarbonization because this is uh, where the industry is at the moment that um, will we be exporting to the EU after the graduation? Everything depends on this. There needs to be a framework. Uh, what is unfortunate is that uh, we have a lot of policies, but then again, there are no policies as such. Why? Because there's a disconnect. Uh, I just want to address some points. Like uh, the panelists before me, you know, they explained more or less everything, but I want to address what are the real points, the problems. Number one, uh, we, the energy policy we have, uh, the discussion is ongoing at the moment for a variable power purchase agreement uh, where I can have an offsite solar uh, farm. And then uh, from there, uh, the energy, uh, um, if I'm using energy in my factory, I can offset it through a variable power purchase agreement where I will pay the willing charge. Now, the problem is um, just, I think two weeks back, Bangladesh Bank issued a circular where it clearly mentioned that new industries cannot um, you know, be set up um, outside of economic zones or BEBSA. Now, the problem is BEBSA has a agreement with a power uh, plant, a private power plant for the source of energy. Mira Shorai also has a captive power plant, which is operated by a private sector player. Now, when we have that, I cannot do the trading because the source of energy is fossil fuel for them because they're using natural gas for the, um, you know, the generation of the power. So this is something which needs to be addressed. And as such, like Bangladesh, uh, like uh, we are always, uh, you know, our development partners are uh, engaged with us all the time. But decarbonization is such a topic that we don't hardly talk about it. So there's a fear of like greenwashing. 
like what we saw in, during that time. So when someone comes and talks to us about this, we think that some, it's something similar. So we shouldn't be, you know, relying on this. We shouldn't put that much uh, importance on this. And um, if the buyer forces us to do it, we will do it. So, and that is the main problem. Uh, because the number one example of this, that when we are forced to do something, we do it. Uh, we have the highest number of green. I'm from uh, the garment sector and the textile sector. I'm saying this, that we have the highest number of green factories in the world. We always say this. Uh, over 217 green factories are out there. 500 are in the pipeline. Uh, besides this, there are over 500 registered certified green buildings, uh, commercial buildings. Out of all of these green buildings and factories, only 60 companies submit the GR GRI reporting and the sustainability reporting. Why? Because government does not make us submit that report. So you're taxed less. No, but it's it's taxed less. Even for that, you're uh, taxed two percent less if you're if you have a green factory, uh, in the corporate tax. Even after that, we are not doing it. So the private sector, we cannot always blame the government. We, uh, the private sector, loves to blame the government for everything, but we also have our responsibility because at the end of the day, we have to work together. And then the other problem is. Um, Bangladesh, I think in the total emission, we only emit about 0.056%. And in terms of vulnerability, we are the seventh most vulnerable climate, vulnerable countries in the world. So there needs to be a special consideration for Bangladesh. We can talk about a lot of things, about solar uh, farms, about uh, a lot of things, but there, is a, there are some limitations with Bangladesh. Number one, the land size. We have to bring this into discussion. You cannot just come and say, like, go for solar farms, go for this. We don't have a um, recycling of batteries because when you have solar uh, cells, uh, like if I'm using uh, solar in my household, there's a battery there. How do I dispose it? Usually what we do, we just throw it outside because there's no legislation that I have to dispose it up safely. As a result of this, I was studying a report that in the southern Bengal, there was this uh, private company who popularized solar, um, you know, uh, the concept of solar, using solar as a source of uh, energy. Um, so when the battery died, they just threw it in the side of the road. And that acidic battery, it swept into the communal pond. And there was a lot of issues with children having deformities or being born with deformities, having autism. So we never addressed this. So we need to have policies in place uh, because this is not a very simple solution. Uh, India has a plan. By 2070, there will be net neutral. Bangladesh has still now, there's no plan as such. For India, for the transition, the cost will be $10.1 trillion. Uh, so it's a huge amount of money needs, needs to be there invested for this transition. In Bangladesh, we all know the secondary market, the, the capital market, uh, uh, bond is something that we are not used to. And uh, we just see it as a financial instrument by either banks or uh, uh, institutional lenders. Like They usually deal with bonds. But from a private sector, because there's no incentive, there is incentive in certain kind of bonds, but it is not um, encouraged by us. But uh, another problem we have is my factory is the only factory in Bangladesh who has a CO2 recovery system in place. We are the highest rated factory in Asia. I have 96% recovery, but I cannot use this credit because there's a mechanism. So when the buyers come visit my factory, they say, well done, we are so happy that you have this here. But at the end of the day, uh, I cannot monetize this. So that thing also needs to come in. And we are talking about uh, you know, going green and everything, but the uh, major source of revenue for the Bangladesh government uh, for the forest earning is the RMG sector at the moment. We are talking about LDC graduation. When we graduate for the European Union, we have to go for double stage transformation, which is the garments and then the backward linkage, we have to do the fabric as well. Now the fabric industry cannot be run on green energy. It is not possible. 
uh, because the national grid here is so weak. There's so many fluctuations. It is not possible to do continuous operations for, to, for the manufacturing of fabric. For garments, you can. So how will you align that? And the other thing is the solutions which are being offered to us at the moment, for example, biomass boilers. So biomass boilers is, um, in Bengali, we say tush, uh, the rice husk. They use that to incinerate, and you generate, you run the boiler using that. But that has an emission as well. But the buyers uh, want to turn a blind eye to that emission, but they will focus on the coal, whereas the coal technology today has gone super clean. There, there's a new process called critical um, coal boilers, which is more cleaner than a lot of the available technologies there is. But just because there's a connotation that coal is bad, um, it, it is looked down upon. So we need to address those points as well, because we need to address what our strengths are and build on that a national policy which will work for Bangladesh. And I just want to, um, another point I want to add is um, the sustainable financing. Like the financing uh, tickets which are available are so big, I don't need that much money. Because whenever I'm engaging, the ticket says outside of Bangladesh, because Iqbal is the only one who's doing this in Bangladesh, it's spread out. But unfortunately, there is also overlapping between the Minister of Environment, uh, the Minister of Power, um, regarding who will be the uh, main point of contact over here. But regarding the financing option, um, I will require like $5 million, but the ticket size offered to me is like $35 million or $45 million. No, I don't need that much money. So the ticket size needs to be rationalized. It needs to come through the central bank or through an agency like ITCOL can disperse, or even the central bank is doing a wonderful job through a third party bank who acts like an agent. And the last point I want to make is um, whenever we see policies in Bangladesh, uh, one of the things is like energy audit. Now we are at the moment in our industry, we are measuring everything. Uh, the whole supply chain we're measuring, but at the end of the day, when because my factory is in the EPZ, so I cannot, even though I wanted to buy the credits, I wasn't allowed to. So it's of no use. So we need these policies changes as soon as possible because 2030 isn't far enough, far away. And to get something rolling, you will need minimum three years for it to be adopted. And for the industry to adopt it, you will need further two years. So in the grand scheme of things, we don't have much time. We need to act very soon. And the... Another thing is that we have always seen in Bangladesh, unfortunately, now uh, this is where the government comes in, is we want, we always see mitigation projects at the expense of adaptation measures. So this thing for the private sector, we also want because if the country does good, we do good. So it's a, it should be a symbiotic relationship. So this is something from the private sector, we would like to see the government take adaptation measures so it's the same for everyone. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Shams Mahmoud. Uh, we will uh, now listen to uh, Dr. Uh, Muhammad Nazrul Islam, additional foreign secretary. Uh, please, uh, you have to, 10 minutes. Bismillah rahman rahim Honorable uh, State Minister for Finance, Her Excellency Wasik Aisha Khan MP, Chief Guest of, of today's event, Vice uh, Chairman, Chair of the Session, Vice uh, Director General, Distinguished Panelist, and Distinguished Audience, Assalamu Alaikum, and good afternoon. Today's uh, topic, application of carbon financing, challenges and policy options for Bangladesh. It is very important. And we listened to Dr. Marcus Kabir uh, in his keynote presentation. Uh, it is, uh, we understand that relatively new for Bangladesh and there are uh, still a lot of challenges. And we look forward to uh, mitigating and you know using this uh, carbon trading scheme for Bangladesh. 
And uh, I was, uh, you know, very uh, amazed to learn from uh, World Bank representative. Uh, she presented some very, uh, you know, pathways, green growth technology, where Bangladesh can focus on. Uh, since paucity of time, and uh, I am not a climate expert, but since I'm working in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, we have actually, uh, there is a division who looks after climate issues in coordination with Ministry of uh, uh, Forest, uh, Environment, Forest and Climate Change, and certainly other stakeholders uh, who, uh, you know, do uh, related to climate issues. And I understand uh, the listening from uh, BGME representative also, there is a, actually uh, dearth of uh, knowledge about uh, how to do that uh, tra carbon trading and perhaps uh, uh, with the UNF uh, triple C if uh, there is a coordination mechanism uh, between Bangladesh through Ministry of Foreign Affairs and Ministry of Environment uh, Forest and Climate Change we can uh, get their support uh, for standardizing uh, our uh, carbon trading scheme what actually uh, moved forward in recent past, we have seen that many countries, as we listen from uh, our distinguished panelists, that uh, countries like Vietnam, uh, even Mauritius, they have developed some uh, new mechanism, even Maldives. So we can learn from them. So framework and regulation formulation with technology and innovation uh, would, would be, uh, you know, number one issue. And second, we... Uh, should identify what are the sectors where we can focus on getting, uh, you know, uh, carbon uh, uh, trading scheme under uh, those. And uh, as we have seen that it is only uh, out of 16 million, 10 million they got from it call. And that is not also very significant sectors. But as a presenter, he was mentioning that RMZ sector could be uh, you know, one of the potential sector. Apart from that, RMZ, we understand that energy, we have listened to distinguished panelists, that energy is one of the important sectors where carbon trading scheme could be utilized. And since it is uh, Bangladesh also moving to renewable energy and green growth technology, and uh, we have uh, very, you know, visionary documents like Muzi Prosperity Plan and Bangladesh Delta Plan 2100, so uh, though it is not you know related to uh, specifying that uh, car carbon financing scheme is there but we can add up in those uh, sectors and energy could be one very critical sector where we can accrue our you know uh, carbon financing scheme in, in that and also some industrial sector apart from rmg there are some other heavy industries uh, like uh, automobiles steel engineering, if they can introduce some sort of, you know, efficient uh, energy use, they can uh, do some. And agri is one, another sectors, actually, if we can teach, make awareness among the stakeholders and community at large, how to, uh, you know, uh, get the carbon emission certification, that they can uh, certainly use that. And as the first part, we should have a robust policy and regulation framework and also awareness building and identifying those sectors and introducing all those sectors. And international cooperation here is very important. Those who are actually advanced in a carbon trading scheme, like Western countries, we have seen that they, they are very quite advanced, uh, like Australia, USA, European Union, and we have excellent ties with those countries. And perhaps you know that last year, Honorable Prime Minister was in Brussels, and we launched a partnership on cooperation agreement with the European Union. So in that uh, framework agreement, we had have already started negotiation and draft yet to be given by European Union. And when it will be given, then in that framework agreement, we can talk about these uh, carbon trading issues and we can have collaboration from European Union as well as other international partners and capacity building and knowledge sharing would be another important areas where certainly Bangladesh can focus on. And I again uh, thanks Abhis for uh, arranging this important seminar. And uh, since uh, Chairman in his introductory remarks, he was telling that it is one of the uh, beginning of our journey for how to utilize and uh, capacity building in the carbon trading. 
So in future, I hope that some technical people, they will come forward and they we can work together between different domestic sectors and also international players. And particularly as one of these Ministry of uh, Environment, Forest, Climate Change, and certainly uh, Ministry of Finance, because uh, we have no, known from our distinguished panelists that it is not only in Department of Environment or Ministry of Environment, uh, but certainly Ministry of Finance, because they have some mechanism of incentivizing uh, tax policy formulation and other things. And certainly, given this economic uh, critical condition uh, globally facing, uh, uh, certainly environmental related issues and Bangladesh facing a daunting task of mitigating adaptation and climate financing. So certainly in this carbon uh, trading scheme, if we can uh, roll out certain mechanism in future, we will be uh, benefited and thank you all for listening to me and look forward to uh, you know some very good outcome of this uh, seminar thank you assalamu alaikum thank you very much uh, <coughs> dr nazrul uh, now uh, we have uh, come to the segment of uh, open discussion and uh, while we register the interest for intervention comments or questions. Uh, I'd like to uh, begin this segment uh, by uh, requesting uh, uh, a distinguished uh, expert in the field and uh, who has been associated with uh, climate discussion, Dr. Ainun Nishat, to uh, make his intervention. Comments, please. Asalaamu Alaikum. Uh, I was not sure whether I would take the floor Reason being, I will leave this room totally confused. I do attend these sort of workshops first that helps me to enhance my knowledge base and also develop some network. So I have at least two friends sitting on my two sides that is definitely a gain for me. Why I'm confused? Reference has been made to Article 6 of the Paris Agreement. Has it been operationalized? Has the details of this Article 6.2, 6.4, or 6.8 has been finalized? Answer is no. The Dubai meeting, the last COP, COP28, in my evaluation, has been a total failure because it was targeted that the Article 6 on this market mechanism and this carbon credit and et cetera, et cetera, would be finalized by that time. It was proposed that the global stock taking, what is happening in the world, would be finalized in Dubai. But the ruler or the, or the minister, Sultan Al-Zabar, was very clever. On the first meeting, he threw $100 million, not billion dollar, and all countries started making, you know, all appreciative comment. On the first day, I told my minister that what is happening. Having said that, the market mechanism that has been referred here is based on the Kyoto Protocol. And Bangladesh has already made two commitments, one through the national NDC document, nationally determined commitment, and Bangladesh has officially signed by our prime minister that we shall cut down greenhouse gas emissions by around 6% on our own, and another 17% or 16% if finance and Technology is provided to us. Currently, the Ministry of Environment and Forest, with the help of UNDP, is developing roadmaps how to implement the NDC document and the NAP document. And there is a third document called Mujib Climate Prosperity Plan. And is an ambitious document. I'm a, I have a technical background, so my English is very poor, but I understand when you say this is an ambitious document, means that it is not going to be implemented. It's a positive way of saying a very hard negative truth. Uh, it talks about by 2040, we will be carbon neutral. How? We are a developing country, or we, we need huge amount of energy to sustain the industries. And can we meet these challenges? Answer is no. So my point is, uh, Dr. Mahfuz Kabir has shown some excellent diagram, but did you see the gap in the carbon emission and the amount of money that is needed? 
one of the discussion mentioned about 100 billion dollar for bangladesh answer is that the global commitment on the green climate fund is that the globe would mobilize 100 billion dollar every year and so far between 2015 and 23 the world claims that they have mobilized 70 billion dollars and the civil society organizations like Red, uh, Oxfam, they don't accept it. They say it is 10 or $15 billion. But we have the institutional mechanism set up in the country. Under the finance ministry, it is the secretary ERD. He is the gatekeeper. His designation is NDA, Nationally Designated Authority. And there are two NIEs. National Implementing Entity, the term has been changed, but I'm using the old term. And one is ITCOL. And ITCOL is supposed to support the private sector and uh, greenhouse gas mitigation sector. The other one is PKSF. So we have the designated people. We have the agencies. Secretary ERD, the chief of ITCOL, and the chief of PKSF. That is our setup. Yes, we need more people. We need more organization. If BC is going to take interest in this particular aspect, we'd be happy to help and provide support to them. So my point is, the world has set up the institutional structure they need. Reference has been given to MRV. Paris Agreement is very clear that in doing the measurement, reporting, and verification, we must follow theory of change. I have talked to at least five secretaries of IMED, present and past. I have talked to some ministers. Are they aware of that theory of change must be applied? We follow the um, LFA, logical framework analysis, that method. So the basic practice, how we are going to report, how the compliance mechanism would be followed up, we have no clue about it. Incidentally, I was a member of the, uh, under Kyoto Protocol of the enforcement branch. It was a quasi-judicial body. And we penalized many countries for not following up the data collection properly. So we should be careful. Let me stop here. But let me say, suggest that I thank these for organizing this workshop. Let, let it be the beginning of our preparation for a staking, staking up. How do we get funds? ITCOL has just collected, I think, $320 million for private sector, which would be distributed. The fund would be distributed through four private banks, and that is exclusively for government industries to make their projects green. So we are doing small works here and there, and I appreciate ITCOL for doing that. So they are the designated authority. Secretary ERD is the designated authority. And the third authority I must identify here is the DG DOE. We need technology. The World Bank is, world, world is sitting with the technological solutions. But if I want to apply for a particular technology to be given to us, the gatekeeper is the DG DOE. We must apply through him. So we need to know the global approach. Funds are there but we do not know how to collect it. Jokingly, I say we do not know how to write the application. So that is where we need to do a lot of work. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you indeed, sir. Very enlightening. And uh, also, I mean, we are aware of the challenges. Uh, but uh, you yourself has uh, pointed out that we have to start. And whatever arrangements we have, we uh, need to make uh, good use of them. Uh, definitely, we are uh, uh, going to uh, do things uh, in a very uh, engaged and uh, expansive manner uh, with all stakeholders. Uh, I'd like to uh, request uh, Professor uh, Dr. Helal Ahmed. He has requested the floor uh, to please intervene. He's Dean Economy, uh, Economy, Economics, uh, North South University. Um, so I think, um, I'm new here, so let me introduce myself a little more. Um, my adult life I spent in Australia and was very intimately involved in Australia's climate change policy. 
uh, between 2001 and 2013. Uh, I was also uh, a lead author of the fifth assessment report representing Australian cohort. Uh, but since then, I have moved away. <laughs> so um, I don't know how qualified I am to contribute to this discussion. Um, I know um, whatever we have heard today, one is the uh, 2050 map, roadmap of what to do to uh, do green growth for Bangladesh to get onto the trajectory. It's an aspirational goal. And then we have to start somewhere. We cannot really spread thin and achieve nothing. So I, I thought if this today's discussion focusing on uh, carbon credits and carbon financing is a good start. And we also heard from it called some of the challenges they faced in terms of uh, even realizing the committed uh, funding in that. So my understanding from today's discussion, like I said, I don't know much uh, about Bangladesh's position, but I understand there is no carbon market. Uh, and reduction carbon and carbon credits are not, are not equal. So we can do reduction under some policies or whatever we do, but when you're trying to create carbon credit, then we have to follow some standard methodology and that measurement, verification, and auditing and all that, and, and it's important. And I understand under CDM, we have uh, established some uh, capacity in that. So my, if I may ask a question to our World Bank representative, uh, I understand you were the trustee member or trustee of the Global uh, Green Fund. So, to what extent? I know you don't know make you don't know this, you don't make decisions, but uh, uh, following this uh, global uh, funding, uh, you um, disperse things. Uh, to what extent we can, if you can educate me at least, to what extent we can uh, draw on that fund to refine our capacity and uh, you know uh, prepare ourselves. Uh, let me also. Um, uh, expose my ignorance. My understanding is that whatever we have uh, set out under the Paris Agreement, it's achievable because we have a, a very um, humble ambition. So that's not um, that's not bringing that in. But in terms of creating marketable uh, uh, um, carbon credits, uh, what World Bank and even DP can do. Um, uh, using some of the global uh, uh, finance uh, that you are trustee. So thank you. Thank you for giving me the floor. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, I'd request uh, Dr. Muhammad uh, Abu Yusuf, additional secretary, Ministry of Finance. Uh, you can make the intervention, please. Thank, thank you for giving me the scope. Uh, I must thank BIS for organizing this workshop on carbon financing. Although uh, my understanding is that uh, it is a bit early for Bangladesh and as Dr. Professor Anand Nishat sir has rightly mentioned, uh, we know we have got NDC 2021 and we have got a very rich national adaptation plan. Now we have got Mozib Climate Prosperity Plan and a rough estimate suggests that to implement national adaptation plan, there are uh, uh, a requirement of around 2000, 230 billion from during 2020 to 2050, average eight billion dollar per year. But how much carbon financing we are actually getting from international sources, very, very insignificant. Today I have checked with my ERD colleague who is dealing with, you know, uh, as an NDA, GCF and other projects. And he uh, confirmed me that till date, GCF, GCF funding, we have been implementing only nine projects and the total commitment was also not uh, disbursed because of some conditions. One of the condition was that uh, the interest rate should be not should not be more than 5%, but because of the softfall rate, uh, you know, international interest rate uh, increase and other rate, and now the standard interest rate is around 9 to 10%. So how can they disperse at 5%? So that is a big issue. 
moreover uh the little bit of statistics that i had uh, although the international uh, commitment was that that there will be a balance between mitigation and adaptation uh, and one of our colleagues have rightly mentioned that uh, we are seeing a lot of interest by our international fund providers in mitigation activities but as the most the worst sufferer of climate, we need more adaptation fund. And our Honorable Prime Minister has also called upon the international community to strike a balance between adaptation and mitigation. But we are not seeing that. The other thing is that we are a, we are a very tiny contributor to the global emission, which is less than 0.5% of the total global emission. We, we, are, we should be at the receiving end and we are supposed to get, you know, climate financing in the form of grants. But the, in the, but the statistics suggest that the fund that we are getting are mostly in loan forms. For example, among the loans from multilateral development banks, 75% are non-concessional. And the amount that we are getting from GCF, uh, around 25% funds disbursed by GCF are for mitigation projects. And around 25% is for adaptation projects. So I don't know why uh, we are uh, getting, uh, why international communities are so much interested in mitigation. Uh, maybe it is because of their, you know, com compunction that they are liable for the huge, you know, carbon emission. But as our national priority, uh, I would request our peace that yes, you have done a marvelous presentation and Dr. Mahfuz has made a good presentation. I congratulate him. But I would request peace that this is one of the renowned uh, you know, research institutions, uh, you may conduct study on the challenges and constraints in accessing international climate funds, uh, including international, uh, you know, climate funds and multilateral development banks. And if you come up with some suggestions and policy actions that may help us to formulate policy uh, to access more funds from international sourcing. This is one thing. Number two, uh, in the presentation, although it is a very robust presentation, I see no challenges. Basically, uh, if we go for carbon, you know, financing, we need to have a carbon financing infrastructure, including, as one person has rightly mentioned, that reduction of emission is one thing, creation of carbon credits, and make it acceptable to the international market is another thing. So there are a lot of measurement issues, certification issues, verification issues. Uh, but as a journalist, I, do not, I don't think that we have got that infrastructure at the moment in our country. So it's very difficult to go for carbon, you know, credit, issuing carbon credit or carbon financing without having the requisite infrastructure. So far, I have seen and in my interaction with uh, Ministry of Environmental Forest and Climate Change, you, we are really uh, in shortage of fund for adaptation. So our priority is now for adaptation. I know that this could be a good source in maybe in the medium term, maybe in 10, 15, 20 years time, the carbon credit, but our immediate need is for adaptation. So I will request this to help us understand how we can, you know, utilize a, a blended financing and then de-risking uh, so that we can also attract private sector. So these are the areas where I think this can help us. So with these few words, I would uh, conclude. Thank you very much for this wonderful session. I thank our Honorable State Minister of Finance, Wasik Aishagar MP, for our kind presence here. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, indeed. Uh, I see uh, there is no uh, other interest uh, in uh, making intervention. Uh, I think uh, to the panelists now, uh, if they have uh, any comment to make, and then after that we'll... Okay. Okay, please. Uh, please introduce yourself and be very brief. Assalamu alaikum, sir. Sir, I am uh, Director General Bimrad, stands for Bangladesh Institute of Maritime Research and Development. I have joined very recently. Thank you very much for such a wonderful scholastic session, preambled by a sumptuous lunch. Thank you so very much. So, just one point I want to make. Uh, we talk about the greenhouse gases and the carbon emission. We are much learned than before this session. However, I want to make this small point that the shipping industry, shipping is the backbone of our international trade. 
and our garments, which we are all proud of, it's transported through shipping. But uh, shipping industry is also very carbon intensive. And the experts, they say, the global uh, emission is about 3%, which is uh, much higher, like uh, that of aviation industries. So I'd love to extend uh, Bimrad's uh, hands uh, as our very near and dear organization, BIASS, in your future endeavors, workshop or whatever. Uh, Bimrad uh, would be very honored to extend our support and work particularly on the carbon financing as regards to the shipping sector, the shipbuilding industries that we have in our country, both government and non-government. Thank you, sir. Uh, thank you, indeed. Uh, now, uh, <clears throat> would like to, uh, would like to, yeah, if, if uh, any of the panelists, so first of all, we thank you for, for, for a lot of these nice comments and questions. I, I'm certainly learning a lot. Um, and it, I think our expert, um, I think Dr. Nishad has left the building. Okay. I was going to address him, but that's not going to happen. Oh, he's right there. Okay. Um, so let me start a few things. One is, yes, the World Bank is going to be supporting the, the government to establish the fund. Yes, it, it's going to be a, a supporting. However, I am not working on this, so I can't really give you details. The details are going to be uh, through the government because it's a government's um, own structure that they want to do. We're just supporting how the government wants to structure this. And that's, I think I, that's all I can say at the moment. I think look more to your Ministry of Environment uh, in Bangladesh and then Ministry of Finance and the Finance Division to give you more of those because it is dictated by the government and how they want to structure. Uh, on on two things, I think Dr. Nishad had very ex agree. He, he actually uh, obviously knows about a lot of these uh, global commitments and COP and, and whatnot, and that's really important. But I think one of the things that's really helpful about this session is that let's focus on Bangladesh. And even if the articles are not all set up, as I showed you earlier in my presentation, there are many other mechanisms. Article 6.2345 is all in process and in, in discussion. You can direct, you can be leading. That is a new um, architect that you have an opportunity, Bangladesh has an opportunity to influence the modality. I've been in this uh, sector, climate finance, carbon finance, JEI, CDM, as I told you about 20 years. And I can tell you the early movers set the rules of the game. So there's no reason why in, in the face of uncertainty, Bangladesh can sit around and wait. You, you can direct, there are opportunities here. And there are early movers already in the, in the world. So there's definitely opportunity. The, the second thing I'd, I'd like to respond to is that it's interesting, you know, actually Bangladesh government has taken an investment today on e-waste. Actually, we're gonna be building, we're investing in Bangladesh's own structure for e-waste processing facility, end of life. So that has not been communicated to you because it's a national project that's been undertaken. So we need to think about if there are these focal centers, um, main points in the government, we must make sure that everybody knows about it. If the country has taken a $300 million loan to set up many of the environmental pollution monitoring e-waste facility, you, the industry, should be the first people to know, at minimum. Nonetheless, other ministries as well. So we need to find a better way for us to all share information that is pertinent because regulations are coming. Regulations are being put together by the government. It is very, um, very encouraging. On my side of the table, I can tell you, I work with the government quite often, very encouraged by the initiatives they take. You can see it. Some of it is not communicated to you. But I think this is something we have to think about as a, as a communication gap. I think that's it for me. I'm passing it to others. Thanks. OK. Uh, uh, thank you very much. Uh, now uh, we are going to uh, request uh, our honorable chief guest. 
uh, to uh, uh, give us uh, her address. And uh, we are going to uh, listen to her and uh, her voice of wisdom. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Adab, Shubha Puranno. Very interesting seminar on uh, application of carbon financing, challenges and policy options for Bangladesh. Uh, the keynote presenter covered a lot of ground. Thank you, uh, Honorable Chair. Ambassador Gosal Azam Sharkar, Chairman of BIS, uh, BIISS, for inviting me again. I always enjoy my um, visits to BIISS because there's a lot of very pertinent discussion uh, in all the seminars. The uh, distinguished panelists, who have uh, talked up on many issues and uh, very uh, attentive audience, ladies and gentlemen. The presentation on pathways of carbon financing in Bangladesh was interesting and the discussion uh, by the panelists were very interesting as well. But somehow I think no one addressed the elephant in the room that to encourage the usage of renewable and clean energy, we need to cut down the subsidies on fossil fuel driven energies. That is the main thing. That is an another very important discussion that the businesses will have to look at. Because carbon financing, carbon credits, all of that comes after when we are used to using renewable energies. So we, I think we are missing a step here. So anyway, um, I pay my deepest respects to the father of the nation and all the martyrs that we lost on uh, 15 August 1975. I pay my respects to all the martyrs of our liberation war of 1971 and to the valiant freedom fighters who are present in this room after uh, independence of Bangladesh, Bangabundhu made disaster management one of the priorities for his administration and initiated the landmark cyclone preparedness program in 1973. We are quite aware that Bangladesh is one of the most climate vulnerable countries in the world. Following the footsteps uh, of the father of the nation, our Honorable Prime Minister, Sheikh Hasina, has made remarkable progress in the socio-economic development of Bangladesh, including disaster management, and uh, taking our voice to the international level about the climate crisis and the climate vulnerable uh, countries, as she is has been chairing that forum. Bangladesh has uh, demonstrated remarkable growth and development despite multiple obstacles and challenges. And one of the main challenges is Bangladesh is and has been severely impacted by the adversities of the climate crisis. When we were talking about emissions and uh, the carbon market and carbon credits, we it it in the same uh, 
uh, way, the conversations about adaptation and mitigations are important. And the conversation about moving away from fossil fuel is also important. And also how to incentivize the usage of renewable energy. We are aware that the uh, power ministry has uh, put into place a net metering uh, system, but my um, brother Shams was mentioning the issues which are still uh, remaining in, in BEBSA because BEBSA has a different uh, law to govern uh, energy usage. So net metering is not applicable there. Yes, that is a problem that we need to address. There are various policies that we have, uh, many of the panelists have referred to, uh, policies like the Climate Change Strategy and Action Plan, National Adaptation Program, Mujib Climate Prosperity Plan, 20, uh, National Disaster Management Policy, and we have heard from the esteemed panelists from World Bank about how certain, uh, how many countries, developed countries have use the carbon financing and the carbon credit system. We in Bangladesh will, of course, not try to invent the wheel. We will, uh, uh, you know, follow solutions that have already worked. That is one thing. Honorable Prime Minister Sheikh Hasina recently said, uh, Quote, Bangladesh is now considered a living laboratory of locally led climate adaptation. My first realization about resource constraint for climate action was at COP15 in 2009. I set up Bangladesh Climate Trust Fund to undertake homegrown adaptation process after returning home from COP15, unquote. Bangladesh has so far implemented nearly 800 projects at a cost of $480 million from our own resources. Even today, uh, 300 new projects were approved at the NEC meeting on the annual development programs. This is, this is an inadequate, inadequate amount, but we require seven to eight billion every year to implement our national adaptation plan. You know, uh, climate crisis is already having a devastating effect on Bangladesh. Bangladesh has the enormous potential to earn carbon credits, uh, as we have heard also from the ITCOL CEO, and the two programs that earned us the most credits, the solar home, sy home system and the improved cooking stove are actually uh, no longer in operation, right? And I think we had more than 6 million solar home systems, which if I ask uh, the it called CEO or Shredda, or the environment ministry, I don't think they'll be able to tell me how many of those 6 million solar home systems are in operation now. So there is also a data gap. And what I always keep saying this, what cannot be measured is never done. So we have to get the data. And uh, the funding I have heard that about uh, for the in improved cooking stoves have also uh, dried up. So uh, the way forward is of course, of course, uh, proper policies 
and definitely ensuring implementation. Because Bangladesh, in Bangladesh, we do have many policies, really good policies. And we are always, uh, you know, uh, complimented of the, on those policies. But implementation and making policies are not the same thing. So the private sector will agree all the time. And uh, the public, in the public sector, there are many, uh, there are, uh, they have, they are being put into position certain parameters that will ensure that implementation is measured and uh, all goals are smart. Without smart goals, it would be very difficult to achieve anything. Achieve what we want to achieve, what achieve our goal of being a smart Bangladesh. So, for, for promoting renewable energy sources, government has taken certain steps. And we all know that quite of in 2021, uh, more than 10 coal plants were canceled. But again, now there are um, super critical coal plants which are which are uh, known to be quite clean, like the one we have in Matarabari. So uh, Bangladesh has the potential to generate approximately 150 billion. I'm not sure if this is in uh, USD or Taka, uh, through the sale of its reserved carbon from the Sundarbans, according to a 2010 survey. Sundarbans has the capacity to store 56 million tons of carbon. There are various trees who are um, who have uh, who are there, which are uh, the best at storing carbon. I know many uh, textile manufacturers and uh, RNG exporters who have gone for solar. Uh, rooftops on their own, and some of them have also been financed by it ITCOL. My, uh, you know, there is a, I'm, uh, there is a fear that I have that is, uh, when we are going for a, for a, for a specific type of uh, renewable energy source, there is a chance of greenwashing. There is a chance of having stranded assets. And when we are thinking of the critical minerals which are required for solar PVs, lithium batteries, et cetera, et cetera, the supply of critical minerals are also limited. And what are who and what are controlling those sources? We have to take that into account. We don't want to be dependent on another, uh, you know, on another nation or nations like the way we are dependent for oil on the Middle East. So, so uh, having a balanced energy mix is always the way to go. We cannot just say that which. Uh, Honorable Prime Minister has uh, rightly said that uh, we are looking to towards having 40% of our energy from clean energy by 2041. That is still a long way to go. And a very, I think that is an aspirational, aspirational goal. So uh, when before the discussion about carbon markets in Bangladesh and carbon credits, we must make uh, have awareness campaigns and make the users of energy understand that 
the energy, the even though renewable or cleaner energy may seem a little bit more expensive, the prices going down every, I mean, every day, but the present uh, electricity that we use, which comes from uh, fossil fuel, it is at the price, at the present price, because of all the subsidies that are given. So uh, I think renewable uh, energy sources, clean energy sources will become more and more attractive as it becomes viable for businesses because everyone understands the bottom line. As we use renewable energy more, the domestic carbon market will become more important. And uh, for now, we should learn to negotiate in the international market and learn the uh, nitty gritties of negotiation and the policies which will be required to be put in place. And I understand that this should be a coordinated effort because if each ministry is doing it separately, it's not going to work out. It's going to make everyone very confused. I have been told that uh, the crucial factor is to provide high quality carbon credits that are supported by thorough baseline assessment, project auditing and verification and approvals from reputable organizations. We have heard uh, in detail from our uh, panelists from the World Bank and from uh, UNDP. This will enhance the ability to negotiate more effectively in the market and bolster the actual influence of the project. I thank uh, the BIISS for arranging this very important uh, seminar and to uh, begin the conversation about um, what will happen in the future and how we should give emphasis to renewable and clean energy. Bangladesh has the potential to emerge as a significant player in the international carbon credit market through effective policies and investments. And uh, when we are talking about getting used to policies, I, I, I was hearing discussions uh, on that line. We were not used to uh, mobile phones and uh, mobile financial services only a few years ago. And uh, I think Bangladeshi people are very resilient and they can adapt very well to technology. So if we can think of uh, digitalization in line, I mean, uh, for carbon credits and etc., then I think Bangladeshi businesses will adopt quicker. And the incentives are a very important point, uh, tax and um, other incentives for encouraging businesses to go the renewable way. With the goal of uh, Bangladesh's re lowering the Bang uh, nation's overall carbon footprint, the government has already taken uh, several initiatives I believe the exchange of ideas in today's seminar will help us more to understand how we can overcome the challenges related to carbon financing and how we can take advantage of including new sources for generating carbon credit and to use more of cleaner energy. I extend my uh, felicitations to BIISS authority the keynote presenter, uh, the esteemed panelists, and today's participants and the esteemed audience. Thank you very much. Joy Bangla, Joy Bangabundu, Joy Sheikh Hasina. May Bangladesh live forever.
thank you indeed, uh, Honorable State Minister and uh, the Chief Guest for uh, your uh, kind guidance and uh, your voice of wisdom and also your uh, uh, the support and the assurance of support from your uh, ministry. Thank you indeed. I am uh, taking the floor for a few remarks. Distinguished audience, uh, I'm not uh, going to uh, make repetition because we have had an intensive uh, discussion with uh, very distinguished panelists and uh, experts. Uh, so as generalist, uh, I, I don't uh, uh, need to venture on the point, substantive points. Uh, what I'd like to... Uh, emphasize here is that yes, we have started this discourse. BIISS is uh, ready to take up the process and uh, we are uh, going to remain engaged and uh, uh, our Director General, uh, General Khan and uh, the research team that we have, uh, we are going to uh, do focused study on this, keeping the practical aspect and uh, the need uh, of the time uh, the national need, in fact. And definitely we are going to uh, connect all the stakeholders and all the uh, relevant uh, uh, sectors and as well as institutions. And uh, Honorable uh, uh, State Minister, the Chief Guest has also uh, suggested that we uh, engage some other uh, departments and uh, institutions who are very, very relevant. Indeed so, and uh, we all know that Bangladesh uh, is a good boy in uh, climate class. It has emitted very insignificantly CO2, but uh, it is uh, bearing the most of the brunt of the carbon uh, climate change. And uh, we indeed deserve to have uh, climate financing, carbon financing, and all that. As good boy in the class, we deserve it. When we see that uh, many bad boys emitting hugely are uh, getting more of the international finance, then uh, it definitely doesn't uh, feel good at our end. So definitely international organizations, institutes, and uh, uh, funding sources, they will be uh, very, uh, forthcoming uh, towards our requirement. And indeed, uh, our uh, leader, Honorable Prime Minister Sheikh Hasina, she has been giving from the very beginning, I, at least I know from uh, COP15, she has been taking uh, a leadership role and uh, she's one of the top seven uh, uh, leaders in climate politics, uh, making uh, enormous contribution that uh, uh, was uh, that that uh, uh, came to uh, fruition and uh, a degree of success through uh, climate agreement in Paris, and uh, uh, she is uh, very much keen about it, and uh, our government is keen about it, and uh, we need to uh, work relentlessly for that. Definitely, we have. Uh, uh, we, we thank uh, the distinguished panelists for giving us uh, very valuable recommendations and uh, suggestions, uh, particularly from uh, the World Bank, particularly uh, emphasizing uh, green uh, uh, course, green growth course, and uh, a suggestion from uh, uh, UNDP uh, were, were very valuable and uh, we are very thankful to them. And uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, in uh, carbon credits, uh, developing this uh, mechanism, we are very uh, late and uh, we have not made uh, good progress, but uh, definitely we have uh, the will to engage and engage the stakeholders and uh, proceed. And uh, it is very important to monetize and also important to give uh, the tools and also uh, the knowledge and expertise 
to those who will be uh, who are uh, going to reduce uh, carbon, particularly in the course of uh, 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 transitioning, energy transitioning, because that is the huge area sector. We have to pay a uh, very lot, lot of attention. And uh, there are, uh, are many other fields and sectors, uh, even uh, the carbon sinks that we are uh, using and developing, uh, we should be using that for uh, availing carbon financing and support and all that. So uh, the, definitely the study uh, that is uh, our, our BIISS is going to undertake, they will uh, keep these things in, uh, uh, in mind and uh, we will uh, gather the stakeholders to proceed. And uh, distinguished guests, uh, we uh, uh, really, uh, it is a start and uh, definitely we are going to hold the uh, very, uh, that, that uh, event of workshop that is we are talking about because that will give us the opportunity of uh, uh, informing and training and giving understanding and knowledge hands on, and that is very much necessary and we are uh, emphasizing on that. And uh, you know, uh, uh, we, we, we need to, uh, this is an existential threat to Bangladesh. We have to take it very seriously. If uh, we do not take it seriously, uh, Father of the Nation Bangabandhu's uh, dream of Shonar Bangla cannot be realized and all our development gains over the years will be washed, washed away. Uh, so therefore, uh, we are. Uh, uh, we hope everybody. We are all uh, ready to uh, take the challenge. And I thank you indeed. Thank you all, particularly our honourable chief guest for her uh, voice of wisdom and directions, and all the panelists for their support. We uh, remain. We'll remain engaged with them, and uh, we we hope to get them uh, more and more in this discourse, which we have just started. Thank you all. Joy Bangla, Joy Bangabandhu. May Bangladesh live forever. <laughs>